If we don't know our history, are we doomed to repeat the past? Have we reached another great divide in America? What is voter intimidation? What is critical thinking? Can our past guide our future in a good way? We're going to chat about all of this and more with Professor of History at Austin Community College, Andreas Tejerina. You're watching Access News, hands on news. Thank you, Andreas, for being here with us today on Access News. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here. I want to start off with a quote. A house divided within itself cannot stand. That's a biblical quote, but made famous by Abraham Lincoln. It seems that America has reached a huge political divide. There's a lot of anger within the parties and within the political system, Democrats, Republicans, voters, non-voters. It seems that all the groups have developed venomous dislikes for, for the other groups. Is this the same or worse than we've seen in history? It is the same. You need, to, so? have, you need to have radicals that will not give in in order to have a revolution against England, the biggest country in the world, most powerful country in the world. You need to have people who refuse to give in in order to have the most destructive civil war this nation has ever had. We've, we've had people who believe in convictions, and frankly, that is what democracy uh, is all about. Democracy in America is not a belief in your principles but a, a religious commitment to those beliefs and a willingness to fight and die for them. That's America. That's not unusual. That's America. So you're saying that you wouldn't expect to see improvements in that area with the political uh, rifts that we have now? You would always see it's something that'll, that'll last? Oh, I, I don't think that we're going to have the constant bickering. I do believe that there is a possible reconciliation. We are going to work things out. We always have. Because at the same time that we have this religious conviction to political principles, we have a commitment as a constitutional republic to uh, respecting minority rights, to always looking for a democratic solution to things, and that commitment is just as big, and it's always carried us through. No, I, I believe we can reconcile these things. Help us to understand how we got to this point. We're at this huge political divide. Can we unite? Is it possible? Yes. Uh, I think it is possible. I, I have absolute confidence that it's possible for this nation to find a, a politically uh, acceptable answer. It may not be the solution. We may not solve the economic problem, but it's going to be the American answer to that, to that problem. And that, that we will find. How? Oh, the same way you do when you're trying to reconcile. Do I pay the car or do I pay the rent? I don't have enough money for both. You have a way to do it. And that's the way the nation does it. Uh, now, what the answer is going to be, I don't know. We're in the middle of it now. For people who uh, are becoming more involved in understanding the political system and, and, and voting, why do you think they have often uh, self-disenfranchised themselves from the voting system? Is our voting process uh, so marred that um, we're not encouraging people to vote. What are your thoughts on that? What uh, can you explain to me? Who are the people who have disenfranchised themselves? Most of the people in our community, if you notice, um, minorities, people with disabilities, they're not voting much. Those who are um, the majority, or who, or who you see voting, 
And, and so what's the difference there? I believe that a, a lot has to do with our history of disenfranchising people, of controlling certain minorities, that those people have internalized that, that behavior, those behavior patterns, and also um, they know very, just as much as a four-year-old can tell when he's going to be spanked, uh, an intelligent American knows very well when he's going to be uh, penalized for voting. All you have to do is lynch a person's grandfather and all of his grandchildren will not ever want to vote. And if they do, it's going to be a major accomplishment. This nation has a history of intimidation, violence, brutality, and disenfranchisement of groups of all different types, largely racial or ethnic. And so it's, it's a matter that we have a legacy of that and that those people also have internalized those, that culture. I can definitely see that happening. Can you give us more of examples of, of how voter intimidation still occurs today? Um, how, what have you seen more recently? Well, I think the, the mere fact that, <clears throat> there's, there's two things that I'll answer you on that. One of them is that one of our political parties has actually established as an objective to disenfranchise people and voters and have voter purges. They're, they're looking at winning the election, not so much by having a good campaign, but by disenfranchising a, a certain voter block. That's a good way to do it because that is proof that that's still going on. The other is that there are people who are, are accustomed to looking to a political boss looking to a, a patron, a figure that tells them how to vote. We have a lot of people who still look to certain figures and certain uh, institutions that tell them how to vote. And that's a very smart thing to do because if they defy that political boss, if they defy that institution, then they could lose their job, their, their income is threatened. And, and there's a lot of people also who have no vested interest in either political party or either candidate. You know this very well yourself. Whether you're an ethnic minority or not, it is possible that you see no vested interest in either party. And for you, you're not, you're not gonna gain either way. So it doesn't do you any good to vote. Now we have a large part of the American population that has no vested interest in Democrat or Republican. I mean, I believe that they feel that way. Is that because of voting intimidation? Or, I mean, do you mean that we should have, um, try to steer away from the voting uh, intimidation? Or? No, I, I just think voting, in, voting intimidation is the, the cherry on the cake. It, it's the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more than just the voter ID laws and the voter purges and, and overt intimidation today. That, that makes people disenfranchise themselves. A few minutes before we go to break, but I just want to take a moment for you to tell me a little bit about uh, voter identification. Can you explain? Uh, voter identification is, is a law that was passed here in Texas that uh, right now is being reviewed by the federal courts for a couple of reasons. One of them because uh, the federal courts believe that it does intimidate and disenfranchise a lot of legal voters in Texas, but also because the federal government fe believes that Texas's history uh, has, has made uh, Texas suspect in anything that deals with voter uh, laws. And so the federal government is now preventing Texas from implementing its voter ID law. Um, so that's, uh, that's what the voter ID law situation is right now. It's under review right now by the federal government. Thank you, Andreas. Um, as you know, that uh, here on Access News, we do a short segment called Presidential Fun Facts. So let's take a few moments to watch Elon. I want to see it. Our ninth president, William Henry Harrison, holds the record for the longest inauguration speech in history. 
At 8,578 words long, it took 1 hour and 40 minutes to complete. Unfortunately, he gave the speech during bad weather, contracted pneumonia, and died one month later, making his the shortest presidency on record. Harrison was president only 32 days. Andrew Johnson was illiterate when he got married at age 18. His wife taught him how to read and write. Johnson was the first president to be impeached. He was acquitted by one vote in the Senate. 131 years later, another president, Bill Clinton, was also impeached and acquitted. Did you know that Thomas Jefferson read not only English, but also Greek, Latin, and French? In fact, he wrote his own epitaph, listing many of his great accomplishments. However, he intentionally omitted the fact that he was president. Rutherford B. Hayes had the first telephone installed in the White House. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, gave Hayes personal instructions on how to use it. Grover Cleveland was both the 22nd and 24th president. He is also the only president to have had his wedding inside the White House. In our present time, we have seen both a father and his son become presidents of the U.S. George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush. Prior to them, there was the second president of the U.S., John Adams, and his son, John Quincy Adams, who became the sixth president of the United States. John Quincy Adams was elected to the office by the House of Representatives because neither candidate, John Quincy Adams, nor Andrew Jackson had enough electoral votes to win. Unlike most presidents who keep dogs or cats as pets in the White House, Adams owned a pet alligator, which he kept in the East Room of the White House. John Quincy Adams also kept a diary for years in which the last words are a stout heart, a clear conscience, and never despair. Thank you, Alan. We're here talking with Professor of History, Andreas Tejerina from ACC. Tell me, how did you get into history? I uh, actually started out in another field for my bachelor's degree, but um, I began to realize that history was the way that I could uh, communicate my feelings and my story uh, and what I felt about America to, to, to other people. So how do you feel about America? Well, I feel that uh, America, to a great extent, misunderstands uh, its own past. And more, more than that, I felt uh, as an American who was misunderstood that uh, I just wanted people to understand I, I really am different from what you think I am. And I think that the, the reason is historical. I was um, brought up in West Texas at a time in the 1940s and the 1950s when uh, race was the primary determinant and in uh, d whether a person was going to be able to go to high school, go into a barber shop, go into a swimming pool or a restaurant. And, uh, and I was one of the people who was not allowed because supposedly I was a foreigner, I was an immigrant, a Mexican. And uh, I began to realize, wait a minute, I'm not a Mexican, I'm a U.S. citizen. Why is it these people think that I am a foreigner and uh, why do they have such bad feelings about people who are of my culture? So I began to study history to first understand myself. Why was I really an American? And why was I a different American? And then I also tried to understand how can I explain to them that they have a misconception? History was the medium by which I could communicate with people. It's really interesting that you bring up that point. Oftentimes people feel like history, you know, the past is the past. Um, but you bring up a very good point that sometimes understanding your past helps you understand your present and maybe your future. 
Can you tell us how we can understand our present and future by learning about the past? I think the way I always say it is that um, in Texas, we have to a great extent omitted uh, an important history of minorities, African Americans, women, Native Americans, uh, Mexican Americans or Tejanos. And uh, by not including them in this beautiful Texas history that we have, we've disaffected them. We haven't given them a history that they can be proud of, and we haven't made them feel that they're part of Texas. The way I say it, Tamara, is if you have no past in Texas, you're not part of Texas today, and you can't feel that you have a vested interest in the future of Texas. In order to rectify that, I try to use history to give people a sense of belonging to Texas, that they help to make the Texas that we have and enjoy today, and therefore they do have a vested interest. They have a reason to work for Texas. They have a reason to vote. They have a reason to try to be part of and build the future of Texas. What I always say is we try to reclaim our past so that we can claim our future. So it almost seems like you're saying that you have to have a sense of self and a purpose before they can actually achieve anything. Is that, am I getting the gist of it? That is correct. You have to have a sense of, of identity and uh, a relationship to society, not before you can achieve anything, but before you can contribute and participate in that society. We're in a democratic society. The person elected as our president is a person that we elect. We need to be informed voters so that we elect a good person and so that demagogues do not misdirect us. A lot of Americans are very capable, productive, and creative. We need to make sure that they use that creativity constructively for our whole nation. I'm glad you brought up the point that actually makes me think sometimes people who um, see uh, history they, they they end up regurgitating what they see on uh, through media and a lot of them aren't critical thinkers they're not really thinking critically about their own thoughts which is how I, I define critical thinking so why is that how can we understand history and how can that improve our critical thinking skills? Well, I think you've said it. Um, if a person uh, individually seeks the truth in a story in the news or the truth in a, a book in history, critically challenge the history. Don't simply accept the Hollywood movie version of, of America or of Texas. Uh, in, instead, challenge that and ask, is that, is that really the way it happened? And if that's the way it happened, why does it not explain the America that I live in today? Uh, critical thinking is something we all need. People need to do their own reading. A, an American electorate that does its own reading in history or the news is one that cannot be misled by demagogues. I look to an informed America as protection for me to make sure that no one ever abuses me or discriminates against me again. I tell my students in history class, I need them to read history. I need them to be informed voters to protect my future. Your students actually have many positive things to say about you as a professor. How do you make teaching history so entertaining? Um, actually, what I try to do is what I feel my professors did not do for me when I was an undergraduate. Now, I had some of the greatest historians as graduate professors, Nettie Lee Benson, Joe B. France. I had great historians. I was very fortunate at, at Texas Tech, at A&M, at the University of Texas, to study with great historians. But I also saw the kind of historian that can give a rote 
mythological history, and it gratifies some people, but it disaffects a majority of the people. And it certainly put me to sleep when I was a junior at Texas A&M University in 1965-66. And I just didn't want to be that kind of professor. I, I then was able to see the real archives, the real documentation in the archives here at the University of Texas, and those told a completely different, more dynamic story. I think that the truth of Texas history is much more dynamic. It's much more dramatic than any John Wayne Fess Parker movie. And I try to tell that side. That really makes me wonder, you know, sometimes you read history and now I wonder, is that fact or is it myth? Because I know a lot of people have different perspectives on history. Like for example, Winston Churchill said that history is written by the victors. Um, Napoleon said that history is a set of lies that are agreed upon, and I know that that's one view, so what do you think about that? Well, um, part of that is the nature of history. History is interpretation. And Napoleon's not exactly right that it's lies. It's an interpretation that he may not agree with, but it is an interpretation. The other part of it is that a, uh, a stable society does have a vested interest in conserving a history that justifies it. And we need to recognize that there is probably almost always another side of history, many historical facts that took place that do not justify this history. Texas, for example, has a big part of its history that conflicts with the canon of Texas history. Uh, that that if it were to be known, it would besmirch many of our Texas heroes. And so it is to the advantage of a, a big part of Texas to keep that hidden. A big part of history is hidden. A big part of Texas history is hidden. And only by seeking the truth and reading history and listening to a historical account critically can we probe that hidden to get more at an understanding of the real Texas that we live in today. In the short time we have left um, for the end of the show, can you explain a little bit about the value of history and why it's important to us? Well, I think uh, generally I will say that history explains the way that we arrived where we are today. If we have people who do not have um, advantages, who do not have opportunities, who live in a part of town that is blighted today, how did they get to be that way? Is it really that they're lazy and not very intelligent? Or can we look to history to explain maybe that there were, um, they were disenfranchised at some point? that there were many advantages not given to them. I think by understanding that, we can better address them and better address the modern problems and, and opportunities that we have in Texas and in the nation today. Give us some local examples of that. Well, I think Austin uh, is, a, is an excellent example of that. Uh, I understand that you've had the chief of police uh, of Austin come on your program. And I believe that the police are a good example of people who have to deal with people in East Austin, for example, that don't understand East Austin any more than the rest of Austin, or especially those new immigrants that are pouring into Austin every day. They don't understand that the, the poor part of Austin, East Austin, uh, was a planned community. There were vigilante raids that drove the Mexican-American citizens and African-Americans out of the nice part of Austin. They used to be on prime real estate at Congress at the river until the city had a plan literally to burn them out and drive them out. Then there was intimidation and literally voter purges. That's why those people sometimes feel disaffected and don't vote, sometimes don't trust the police, and, and that's why the police do have conflicts with them today. They've got a history of that kind of conflict that was planned by the city of Austin. Thank you for bringing that to us today, and thank you for being with us 
here today on Access News. You can learn more about Austin Community College at their website and at our website, accessnews.us, where you can ask questions, share your comments and opinions, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. One beautiful thing about America is that we the people have power. The more we know, the better decisions we make. For Access News, I'm Tamara, and that's Austin. Created, written, and executive produced by Devorah Ben Moshe and Ken Hurley. Hosted by Tamara Suter Okudo. Interpreter for Tamara Suter Okudo, Jennifer Stoker. Segment host for A More Perfect Union, Elon Ben Moshe. Special thanks to Texas School for the Deaf. Funding provided by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Supported by Austin Community Foundation. Production by Austin Community College. Civication Incorporated www.civication.org